And we're good to go in uh, just a sh Yes, we're good. You got a one. All right, thanks for coming, guys. Uh, I'm Peter Weller, I work at the Civil Coordination Center in Pittsburgh, and today I'm going to go over our fuzzing frameworks that we have. We've got the basic fuzzing framework, otherwise known as BFF, which is for Linux and OS X, and then we have a failure observation engine, which is on Windows, and it's called FO. And once I go over some of the features of both the frameworks, I'm going to do a demo of FO in setting it up the Fuzz Libre Office. This is the lawyer slide. <laughs> so what is fuzzing? If you go to Wikipedia, you get this long, somewhat boring definition that may or may not make sense to you, but I think we can simplify it a little bit by just kind of looking at a picture. So we have a PDF file opened up in a hex editor. And we just change one byte, so it'd be like a 90 to a 10, and that's technically fuzzing. That's as simple as it gets. So we have two types of fuzzing: smart versus dumb. Dumb is usually considered mutation-based fuzzing, so it's semantic slice modification of the input. It's just like flipping random bytes that you're totally unaware of what the format is. And then there's generational, which is sometimes called smart fuzzing, and that's semantics aware modification of the input. So you know something about the protocol of the format, and you're fuzzing specific things about it. You're not just randomly fuzzing bytes. And while it's the least sophisticated, we still focus on dumb fuzzing because it's still effective at finding vulnerabilities. Some of the cons of smart fuzzing is it there's a high upfront cost. Like if you go and look at the PDF specification, it's 700 pages. That's a lot to learn and figure out, okay, how am I going to model that? And which parts am I going to fuzz? And if you're a developer and you're just doing QA, you want to spend all that time figuring out how to set up a model for your file format. You just want to be done fuzzing and just run it. But some of the cons of dumb fuzzing are it's less effective on compressed formats or text formats. So like a docx now, that's actually a zip file with some XML and then binary data like a PNG picture or something like that. And if you just fuzz a docx, you're actually fuzzing a zip container. So you're, you're not going to really find any vulnerabilities in that because you're going to break the CRC checksum and it's not even going to open a file. It's going to be like, I don't know what this is. Or with XML, if you just don't fuzz it, you're going to break the XML schema and it'll be the same thing. It's not going to parse it because it's going to be like, this isn't valid at XML, so I'm not even going to try and open it. So to do those formats, you need additional smart features. And one of the challenges for our mutation-based fuzzing is you're going to find a lot of crashes and then you need to figure out, okay, which of these crashes are actually unique. And then you want to figure out okay, which, are, which of these crashes do I actually care about, which are exploitable, because obviously I want to fix the exploitable ones first. So for our fuzzing frameworks, the features are all about making the fuzzing smarter. And first up, we have what's called RangeFinder, which is in both the frameworks. So you got to ask yourself, okay, what do I fuzz? How much am I going to fuzz? If I fuzz the file too much, the application won't even open the file because it won't recognize it as the file format. So you want to kind of find that sweet spot. So with RangeFinder, you kind of break it up into ranges. So we say we're, gonna, we're only going to fuzz like 0.01% of the file, or in another range, we're going to fuzz 1%, and another range will be 5%. And then we give all those ranges a score. And when it finds crashes, then it helps the score for that range. And eventually it starts to focus in on more productive ranges that actually find crashes. So like here's an example. Like in, in between the five and ten range, it started to find some crashes, but then like you don't want to lock in too quickly, so you get to search in all the ranges and then eventually you kind of settled in on 15 to 20, that's where all the crashes started happening. So it kind of focuses on that range more often because it finds more crashes. And then next up, we've got the minimizer, which is in both frameworks. 
So what is minimization? Okay, you take a file and you fuzz it. Let's say you fuzz 1% of it. It might turn out that that mean crash is actually caused by just a one byte difference. So the minimizer just runs and figures out the least number of bytes that need to be changed to produce the same unique crash. So like in this screenshot we have on the right side is the C file, which is the, the no good PDF file, and then on the left is the minimized file. So in that case it was just one byte difference was what was required to cause the crash. And here's an example. So on the top is our C file, that's the known good file. And then in the middle is the mutated file, so all those purple bytes are mutated bytes. And then on the bottom is the minimized file, and the red ones are the bytes that are actually needed to produce that same crash. So you can see we, we lost a few of the purple ones because they weren't required to make this the same crash. And another feature we have is what we call minimized string. So it's the same concept. You have a C file, you get the mutated file in the middle, and then on the bottom you have the, the red bytes, which are the crash bytes that are unique, and then the green ones are irrelevant bytes that could be anything. <coughs> they don't have to be related to the file format or anything, so you can put anything there, like the shell code, if you were trying to develop a concept. And then you can, you'll know that, okay, if I put my shell code here, I won't break this unique crash or so I'll still get the same crash even with my shell code in it. And here's an example of that. Like on the left side is the, the PDF in a hex editor, and then kind of to the right of that arrow, you see all these X's. So those are all the, the irrelevant bytes to the crash. And we can replace those with X's or anything. And then stuff that's like right to the arrow of the arrow, that's like the the actual star, the stuff in the PDF that needs to be there to produce the same crash and still be like parsed. So now we have a crash loaded up in the community debugger, and it's an access violation when executing that memory address. So now we loaded up with the minimized to string version of the crash, and you can see right there in the registers ECX, EDX, EBX are all pointing to a bunch of X's. So we know that we control those registers. And then over here on the stack, you can see it's all the X's again. And this is uh, pointing to an XSCH record is over written with X's. So now we know that we control the structure exception handler. So we could change that to point to somewhere else rather than in the exception handler, and that means we can control the code flow. But one problem is, okay, which X, which 78 is which? And the solution to that is what's commonly called the metasploit string pattern. It's that non-repeating pattern. So now we've got that same crash, but we've minimized it to the metasploit string. And now you can see those registers rather than just X's, they have that non-repeating string in it. Same with the DDD stack and the SDH record. So if you are familiar with Coraline's Mona script, he has a feature called find MSP, and that will actually find that string in the split pattern, and then it'll tell you like the offsets. So that way when you're crafting an exploit, you know like where it is in memory. So now it's it's the access violation when executing this new memory address, and that's actually the, the metasploit pattern there. Also on the stack. And we just released a new version like a few days ago, and it's now got a crash recycler. And what that does is you can take a crash and then recycle it as a C file. And then keep running the fuzzer, and we find that that actually helps to find more unique crash and test cases. And I've got unique in quotes here because. A unique crash and test case does not equal a unique bug. You could get like a thousand unique crash and test cases, but it might actually turn out to be like 10 actual bugs underneath, so you need to keep that in mind. And for BFF, we use call grind. 
we have a script called callsim.py, so it's kind of hard to see, but all those hashes are unique crashes, and they're grouped together based on their call tree that called kind of find. So the, the ones that are closer together, like on the same leaves or branches, are probably similar bugs, maybe even in the same code. So that just kind of gives you a nice visualization of where the bugs are. And on BFF, we have something called the Search Triage Tools. And if you're familiar with Microsoft's Bang Exploitable Debugger extension on Windows, that figures out the, the exploitability classification of a crash. But there wasn't anything like that on Linux, so we had to write the Search Triage Tools. And we have a script called Exploitable that does a pretty similar thing where it looks at a crash dump in GDB and then come up with an exploitability classification for it. And this is the triage script, which just takes all your crashes and kind of categorizes them with the classifications. So there's like a site called on PC, possible stack corruption, eager. And another BFF feature we just added is pin traces. So what this is for is some crashes are going to completely demolish the, the stack trace. So you're not going to know like what function was called last, right before the crash. You get something like this, which is just a bunch of memory addresses, which isn't very useful to look for QA or anything. So if that happens, we can detect it with BFF, and then we run the crash room again, but with pin running as well. And that produces a trace of what was executed, and then we get something like this, where it shows all the functions that were called up until the crash. On the other side, we have a feature called drill results, and that's just the Python script that goes through, you know, you, you run your fuzzer for a week, and then you get a thousand crashers. And now you're like, okay, which one is the shot that you care about? Which one might be exploitable? So that's what drill results does. It goes, it gives it like a new exploitability rank. It tells you the byte pattern is in the fuzz file. So what that means is this, this byte pattern is in your your mutated file, your doc, or your PDF, and that tells you that if it's in your file, then you obviously control whatever is in the file. So that means you can change it and use that to take over control flow of the program. And 10 is, the rank 10 is considered most exploitable, and then it goes higher and it's less. And for both, we just added dynamic GUI app timeouts. So if you used an old version of Go, you actually had to set a timeout. Like, if the application doesn't crash, you know, it stays running, and then after 10 seconds, we'll kill it because it doesn't crash, and then move on to the next iteration. But now we can monitor the CPU usage, and let's say after five seconds, the CPU usage goes to zero. So then we assume the application is done parsing a file, and then we just kill it automatically. So that really helps speed up throughput when you're using GUI applications. And another thing we have is crash uniqueness by exception chains. So in the old version, we just the first exception we got, we just stopped. That was all we went with. But there could be cases where if you continue through the exception handler, you get new crashes that are different exploitability ranks. So like before we would stop at E0, and that would be probably not exploitable. But then we would have missed all these, these lower ones in the chain. These are all considered unique crashes, but some of them have different ranks. So E3 is exploitable, blue is probably exploitable. So now we, we keep track of all those in the chain and let you know which is the most exploitable. And we just edit and zip file awareness and control. So like modern file formats like your docx, xps, these are all zip files. So like you can actually take a docx, rename it, not zip, and extract it. So before, if you tried to fuzz a docx, you would fuzz the zip container, which isn't going to be very effective because you're not going to be parsing the file. But now we can, Poe is aware of zip files, and it will extract the container and then put all the, the contents in this big blob in it'll still dump fuzz the contents of that blob. So it's not perfect where like you 
could, with a docx, you know, you have XML in there, and you, you could still close that XML and break that schema, so it, it's not going to be too effective, but it's a nice first step for us. And then we have some future plans. We want to get BFF working for Android. Um, we're currently working on that. We want to get uh, code coverage and awareness added. So if you use Peach before, there's a script in there called Inset. And what that does is it uses pin to, like, you got file and C files, and tell me what is the minimum set of those files that will get the most code coverage of the application. So we want to get that feature added in so that way we can, like, when we find new C files that add to the code covers, and we want to throw it into the buzzer and start plugging that. So that way we'll find new plugs that we missed before because we didn't have that code covered in our old C files. And then we want to get distributed fuzzing working so you can take the framework and put it in the cloud, like Amazon or whatnot, and just throw as much EC2 instances at it as you can afford. And then, of course, improved crash triage and exploitability. Like, bang exploitable for Windows and search triage tools are not perfect. You know, you, you can get a thousand crash and test cases that are considered unique, but it's only 10 bugs, so we always want to improve that. And then we have the add brute force determination of the bytes that affect the faulting address. So in some cases, you'll get a unique crash, and depending on what the faulting address might be, it might be easier to exploit or not. So that's a feature we could add to kind of brute force that to get you all the, all the options in the info. Do you have any plans to add more coding? Uh, we would like to, but it's, we haven't started anything, so it would be a while before we added anything for network coding, because that's a little harder problem. You have to keep the state of what you've sent to the server. And yeah, it's a lot harder <laughs> so. All right, and now I'm gonna do a demo. Okay, so this is the config file for FO. I have it set up for Fuzzy Leader Office. So first thing we got is a campaign ID. And that can be, you name that whatever you want. It's gonna throw that in the folder of the ID name. So all your results and all your crashes are gonna go there. And then we have a, a key Python books. Option that's mostly for debugging. That's like if you have a crash that happens when you're running just the app, but when the debugger's attached, it doesn't happen. That's, that's what we consider a high debug. Uh, we have a button clicker, which I'll show in a little bit. So, all we need to do is change this, put in the full path to LibreOffice, and then that's going to run the, the command template here, which is the program, which is that's right about you see in the C file. <clears throat> One thing to note, if you set this up yourself on something, uh, the, the default is set up to do image magic, and it has this null after C file. So I've deleted that because I don't need that for <coughs> this, this app. So that could be something that you can talk about with trying this out for the first time. And then we just have the C files directory, so any files you want to fuzz, you put in the C files directory, the, the fuzzer directory is like our campus working directory, the results directory, that's where all the crashers are going to go. Uh, we have some run options, first iteration, last iteration, those are zero by default settings. The fuzzer's going to run forever unless it crashes for some reason. <clears throat> Normally you can just keep those as defaults. The minimizer is turned on by default. Recycle crashers, that's actually off by default. And then we have some different mutators. The default is called byte plus, so that just pluses random bytes. We have some other things like the CR MUT or CRLF MUT, which does, it replaces carriage returns with random values. <coughs> and then we have like the null 
ones, which are replaced with null bytes with random value, random values. So think about strings that are null terminated. So if you start throwing in nulls in a string, you can, that might find you bugs because now you're screwing up the null termination on it, or you're messing up with the, the character turns. But usually I just use byte bugs. It works with most cases. Uh, there's a plug zip container is false. That means we don't want to flood the zip container, we want to flood the contents of the zip file, so that's why that's false. And then we have the debugger options. And it has that watch CPU is auto, that was the, the GUI time thing I was talking about. Like once the CPU goes down to zero percent, it kills the app and moves on to the next iteration. And then it's using we're using WinDebug as our debugger. Microsoft Bang is a portable extension. So that was mostly all of the calls. And all I really needed to change was the path to Jupyter Office. Okay, so. And then to run it, you just run photo.py, which is in your config file. Fires up the graphics. Now, you might notice, okay, this doesn't look right. I've got this document recovery wizard popping up every single time. <coughs> so, we're not, we're actually not fudging anything. It's because the stupid wizard keeps coming up. It the, the files, the file crashed last time, I know. I can't open that. So, that's something that you keep in mind when you're fudging things is that. There may be things like document recovery wizards that get in your way. So there's actually a, a command line parameter for leader office. You can do uh, no restore. You can launch leader office with no restore, then that gets rid of that document recovery wizard. Oh, sorry, I messed up already. What thing you need to do? <laughs> when you're kind of restarting your fuzzer, you need to clear out this fuzzer. This is the working directory. So if you need to change like your config file to mess something up, then you need to delete that fuzzer. Okay, so it actually, I don't know if you can see, hopefully you can see that. You can see it says minimizing crash. So that means it's actually found the crash already. And it's minimizing it by the, you know, the least number of bytes to produce that unique crash. And that's what all this is right here. And this is an old version of LibreOffice, so that's why it's crashing so much. Okay, and then I'll let that go on. So I was talking about the button clicker feature that we have. So we just fire up. This is going to be a button Adobe uh, Reader. So you see these pop ups, like insufficient data in the image. Button clicker will actually click those buttons for you because that can help increase your throughput. Because like once you get OK, it usually just closes the app. So that's what the button clicker will do. So let me fire up the config. The button clicker turn it on. Sure does. I know it pops up as the button clicker. You can see it says like sense handle OK. So that means if you click OK on whatever that pop up was. So you kind of know it's, it's a little bit faster. So that's just one feature that we've added to kind of speed up things. 
So now let's go back to my LibreOffice run <laughs> and still you can imagine run on, on crashers. <laughs> So all that gets dumped in the results folder, my camping items, so it's like a probably explorable. And then there's the that's a major dot minor cache that comes from the uh, thing explorable. And that hash comes from the stack. So that's what you use to determine the uniqueness of a crash. And yeah, I have one crash that's more interesting to look at. So we have this dot in the sec file. This is the wind bug output and the bang explorer output. So these mod loads are still in ELL, so I can load it in a different part so that I have to run. And then you have uh, right here we have our registers, GX, GX, and all that. And further on down, we have the default instruction. EAS plus four, and then we've got our stack trace. And at the very bottom is the bank exploitable classification. So it says three access violation on control flow. It's exploitable. So that sounds interesting, right? It's an access violation on control flow. That's what we want to control flow. So, okay, faulty instruction. Was a call on EAX plus four. So we want to know do we control EAX? Because it's calling EAX. If we control EAX, then it'll call our pointer if we give us something in EAX. So I thought I too much there. All right, so here's EAX right there. Like I said, so what we need to do is. So, I guess I'm 
done early. So any questions?
Yeah, that is. It seems like an edge case, but I actually run into fairly common things. Yeah, I believe it. <laughs> it probably doesn't happen a lot more. I know at one point we actually modified Bo to be able to attach to a different process, so I can see if we still have those changes around. Oh, yeah, that'd be awesome. I can keep you hard. Any other questions? Yes. Do you have more information about the uh, patch Microsoft put out related to LibreOffice? Uh, which patch? The the OWA patch, right? LibreOffice was a comp component of Microsoft. I think I saw something on your cert page about the actual what what you guys found. I think the OWA was outside hand is what was being used in our files. Okay. All right, that's all the questions. Thanks for coming.